a child, I was in awe of this toolbox because my granddad's toolbox seemed to have a tool for everything. My granddad seemed to be able to use these tools to solve problems that need, everyday problems that needed fixing. For example, for the broken bounced on bed that we'd bounced on, of course, it was a series of plates and bolts and rivets constructed together to make this new Frankenstein bed even stronger than before. And for the problem we had of freezing cold clothes in the morning in the house that I grew up in as a child with no central heating and ice that was on the inside of the windows, my granddad designed this carefully constructed wooden shelf that sat over the only storage heater in the house. And we then had warm, toasty clothes. But my granddad's great asset was not the fact he could teach us to use these tools, but he, he taught me the tool of leadership. He taught me how to lead myself. He taught me how to lead. He taught me that leadership was a multi-tool that could apply to anything. And here I am, a generation later, as a head teacher. And every day I use that tool of leadership to overcome the everyday problems that I face. But every day I come into school, I see a generation where many children don't know how to lead themselves. They've never been taught it. It perhaps can be taking the form of the mass problem that they face. And they don't know how to do it, so they just give up. Or they quickly write an answer that they know to be wrong just to keep the teacher quiet. Or maybe it's that relationship difficulty they have. And so they just melt down and they freeze. Or they run to their parents to solve it for them. You see, this problem, though, isn't just isolated to the UK. In my trip to Kenya to see some of the poorest communities in Nairobi and Navasha, I came across a similar thing. So, for example, in the project that we saw, there was Kennedy, who didn't get the point in school, so he just didn't bother turning up. And then there was Beth, who was afraid of how the teachers might be harsh with a wrong answer, and so she just froze and just didn't say, say a word. You see similar problems again to the UK. And in both countries, we see poverty mindsets in children, poor thinking. Maybe you've come across these too. You know, you've got that hopeless thinking when they come across a problem and they just can't do it. And so they just remember all the times when everything else has gone wrong and it's hopeless. It's hopeless. I just can't do it. I'm useless. Or maybe it's that lazy thinking. They just sit there and let the teacher do it for them. Or maybe it's that recycled thinking when they leave their, their homework to the last minute every time and every time they feel anxious, but yet they keep doing it. The saddest one for me, though, is the fixed thinking. The child that perhaps gets a bit angry and every time they get angry, they end up getting in a fight and every time they get in a fight, they get in trouble and every time in trouble, they say the same thing. It's just me. It's just the way I am. I have a behavioral difficulty. There's nothing I can do about it. Or maybe it's stuck thinking. You know, they have that difficulty and so they just leave it for a friend to sort for them or for the teaching assistant to come and take over. You see, in both countries, we see these poverty mindsets. And these poverty mindsets trap our children in a story of defeat. And without mindset change, that story will remain the same. And so we need to teach them the secret of granddad's toolbox. We need to teach them how to lead, how to lead themselves. We need to teach them that leadership will help them pick up their life pen again and write that new story. You see, just as my granddad taught me how to lead myself, we need to teach children how to lead. And so that's what we did. In a project in the UK and in Kenya, my new friend John from worked for the school, Elthira School in Nairobi and Kenya. And I worked with four schools in Suffolk in the UK. And we taught them seven leadership mindsets in a multi-sensory way. We taught them, first of all, to lift up their head. We did this activity where we had them pecking like chickens, and all they could see was the stuff in front of them. And then we taught them to be eagles, to be up high, to look around, to see the panorama, and to realise actually the problem they felt was huge is actually tiny in comparison. And that actually there are things around them that can help them. Oh, so what was the impact of that? Well, what we saw in Uthiru School, and in Uthiru School, they got them to score themselves one to five about how they felt about themselves, with five being the highest. And before the project, we had 81% of them scoring themselves two or below. But by the end of the project, we had 90% of them scoring themselves four or above. They began to lift up their heads. And then we taught them to see themselves as a leader, and what we did there is we got children to think about good leaders that they knew and bad leaders that they knew. And we got them to think about how good leaders lift them up 
But how bad leaders push them down? And we got them to think about what does a good leader think? What does a good leader say? And what does a good leader do? And to apply that to themselves. And then, of course, once they realize what a good leader could say, think, and do, they could apply that to themselves. And so what's the impact of that? Well, we saw this wonderful example from one of the year three children in Bosmere School in the UK pilot. And she realized how she worked through problems and how she overcame them. So she designed this poster about how she could work them through. And it wasn't just for her. She used this poster in her school to teach others. She'd begun to see herself as a leader. And then we taught them to be proactive. We had them running on their front foot and how good that felt and how nothing would knock them sideways. But when they were on their back foot, how easy it was to fall over for that little thing. And then we got them to, to lean back and see how just one finger would push them over. But how leaning forward, it would take all of somebody's force and they still couldn't push them over. We got them to be proactive. Well, the impact of this in New Theory School is they had a 25% rise of children homework, handing their homework in on time. So we got them to lift up their heads, see themselves as a leader, to be proactive. And then we taught them to see and take responsibility for themselves. We talked to them about the problem they might have had with litter in their community. And we said, whose responsibility is it as we started throwing down litter in front of them? And of course, they said, well, it's the person who threw it down. But before long, as we talked about it, they realized actually now that they've seen it, they need to take responsibility. Otherwise, the story of litter would remain the same. And the impact in Uthiru School. In Uthiru School, they have no school dinners like we have here in the UK. If you want lunch, you have to bring it in yourself. And only 30% of the children brought their lunch in with them. And before the project, only 15% of them shared their lunch with others. But at the end of the project, 85% of them shared it with others. And then we taught them to change something. If they've seen something, they've seen it's not working, don't do it the same way, change it. And so we told them the story of Angry Ben. And Ben couldn't read and write very well, so he was called Thicky Ben, and he got angry, and he got in fights. But one day, his mum his came home, having been taught to read by a work colleague, and she taught her boys how to read. And before long, Angry Ben became, he became reading Ben, he became clever Ben, and he went on to become a successful surgeon. Well, what's the impact of that? Well, I love this part of the story. As I'm telling this to some of my children, one of them who had real difficulties with behavior, he said, that's me, that's me, I'm Angry Ben. I need to change. Now, he still has difficulties, but he recognizes that he needs to change something. And then we moved on to focus, focus. We reenacted that David Beckham free kick. Do you remember the one? The one against Greece? The one in the dying minutes where he scored the free kick to rescue victory from the jaws of defeat to get a place in the World Cup final. We got them to reenact it and think about all the interference that was coming from the crowd and in his own head. But it reminded them how David Beckham had practiced, practiced, practiced that free kick and how he had to focus on it. And we helped them understand if they wanted to achieve something, that they had to think about their performance was going to be their potential minus their interference. And if they could reduce that interference in their head, those negative voices, they too could achieve their goal. Now, I love the impact of this one. I want to tell you about Aaron. Aaron is one of our year five children in my school. And when we talk to him about the five stages of a story and how you need to know you're here and you're there as the first two steps, he proudly told us what his there was going to be. His there was going to be a zookeeper. But not just any old zookeeper, a zookeeper of wolves. And every day now he tells me how he's looking after his dog. And now he's telling me how he's looking after his neighbor's dog. Because he knows he has to focus and practice, practice, because he wants to become a zookeeper of wolves. And finally, we taught them appreciative thinking. We talked to them about a quest. You know the quest, when you're facing that ogre on the bridge, and you've never defeated an ogre before. And it all looks hopeless, until you remind yourself you've already be defeated the soldiers. You've defeated the mermaids that have tried to lure you to the rocks. And you've defeated the evil creatures of the woods. And that gives you the confidence and the skills to defeat that ogre. Now, for the children, their ogre might be their A times table. And once they remember that they've learned their twos and their fours, that gives them the strategy and the confidence to tackle that last one. You know, we have taught our children how to lead. And with a leadership mindset change, the story can change too. You see, as teachers, we can teach them. We can teach them how to lead. 
We can also teach in Google course and give them the English and the maths, and we can give them the geography and the history. But unless we take and put leadership at the core of our curriculum, unless we do that, we will miss out on the inspiration. You see, we as teachers need to teach our children how to lead so they can lead themselves, they can lead others, and so that they can inspire the next generation. We need to be as teachers. We need to teach them how to lead, and we need to be Grandad's Toolbox. Thank you.